Got some changes to the agenda. Um, at the last minute, uh, Commissioner Williams uh, uh, is unable uh, to attend, so we're uh, he's being represented by Jan Lindsay from TEA and uh, represented well, represented quite well, and uh, she's an old friend of this group and of the coordinating board. So, welcome. Um, and uh, Deborah is not here, and uh, David, uh, you're representing her, so thank you for coming. And Phyllis will not be here, but Drew Cheverly will be here at some point. Um, I, it's unfortunate that, uh, that Michael is unable to come uh, because um, this is the last meeting that I will chair because, as you know, this is rotating uh, chairmanship and uh, the uh, uh, the chairmanship of this body reverts to the Commissioner of Education as of uh, the, our next meeting. So I thought it would be valuable for him to have an experience of at least one meeting before he had to chair the group. So anyway, we'll, uh, I'm sure Jan will pass along to Commissioner Williams uh, uh, information about how this committee works, how this council works and so forth, and we'll go on from there. We did have a few Okay. Well, good. Then we'll uh, we'll we'll, uh, we'll do that. Let's uh, let's take care of some of the uh, bookkeeping issues, the logistical issues. Um, first of all, we have uh, consideration of uh, the approval of the minutes from the July 2012 uh, meeting. I hope you all have had a chance to look at those, and if, if uh, I will entertain a, a motion to adopt them. So moved. We have a second. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Okay. We are. They are adopted. We will move very quickly to uh, the next agenda item, which is uh, the uh, presentation by Commissioner Williams, who is being represented by Jan. So, Jan, uh, uh, please. Uh, Go ahead with your remarks. Okay, and these will be very brief. Um, as Commissioner Paredes mentioned, Commissioner Williams was called away and unable to attend today's meeting. He had really been f looking forward to meeting with this group and participating in some of the robust discussions about shared interests that are represented around this table. He did ask me to convey his enthusiasm for the work of the P-16 Council and to let you know that he really is looking forward to sharing with you uh, his vision for public education and priorities. Uh, he also asked that I give you just a brief overview of a number of changes that have occurred at the agency, um, just so you'll have a better sense of um, what the structure is at this point. And as many of you know, a little over a month ago, Commissioner Williams accepted the position of our appointment of Commissioner of Education at the Texas Education Agency. Um, just a few uh, things I'd like to let you know about his background. He was Assistant Secretary of Education for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Education and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Law Enforcement at the U.S. Department of Treasury. Uh, he's also a former adjunct professor at Texas Southern University School of Public Affairs and Texas Wesleyan University School of Law. Uh, he has been a chairman, past chairman, of the Texas Juvenile Probation Commission and a former honorary chairman of Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Texas. Most recently, he was former chairman of the Texas Railroad Commission. Um, in addition to uh, Commissioner Williams' addition to the Texas Education Agency Management staff, Lizette Gonzalez Reynolds, uh, formerly one of the agency's deputy directors, has been elevated to chief deputy commissioner. Um, and last May, just five months ago, uh, Dr. Robert Duran, who is former superintendent at San Antonio Independent School District, joined the management team at TEA as Deputy Commissioner of Finance and Administration. Joining Dr. Duran is Michael Berry, uh, most recently from the Governor's Office, uh, who has joined TEA to serve as the second Deputy Commissioner responsible for programs and policies. And Michael worked at TEA before going to the Governor's Office, and so we're glad to have uh, him back along with his expertise. Um, TEA has been um, 
dealing with a number of uh, high profile issues of recent months. Uh, most recently, TA has undergone sunset review and we're expecting that report to be posted um, possibly by the end of this week. We've also been preparing for the legislative session, as I know many of the rest of y'all have as well. Uh, we've been preparing to respond to several school finance lawsuits. Uh, in addition, we're preparing a waiver to be submitted to the U.S. Department of Education and are in the process of soliciting uh, stakeholder feedback. Um, we've recently launched a college and career readiness online resource site uh, that we're excited about. And of course, we're continuing our work to support the teachers, administrators, and students uh, across Texas. So our plates are full, but we're honored to share responsibilities uh, for Texas children with um, those in the P-16 Council. Thank you. Thank you very much for that report. Uh, we, uh, I, I had, uh, I had lunch with uh, Michael a couple of weeks ago, and we had a, we had a very uh, 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 good conversation about uh, how the two agencies can work together, and uh, we uh, are going to continue some of the work that was begun when uh, Shirley Neely was commissioner, and then when Robert Scott uh, uh, was in charge, and uh, I think Michael will. Uh, recognizes uh, the need for higher education, public education, work closely together. I, I will uh, distribute uh, comments, uh, um, my comments last week uh, in the State of Higher Education address, and in that uh, in that speech, I talked about the need for higher education, public education, more, to work more closely together, and I. I said we can't do our job unless K through 12 does its job, and K through 12 can't do its job unless we send them good teachers. So we have a, we, we we have a lot of mutual interests, and uh, it's it's absolutely important that we work more effectively together. Um, what we do uh, what we do it uh, uh, together has uh, ramifications for everybody that's uh, sitting around this. Uh, uh, this uh, dais. Uh, we, uh, we, we all know that uh, education, more education leads to better health outcomes. We know that uh, uh, better education leads to a more robust workforce environment. Uh, we know that uh, higher levels of education uh, improve uh, uh, the quality of life in, in virtually every imaginable way. So. It's clearly important that we uh, recognize uh, the need to uh, uh, to cooperate effectively. We cannot do our jobs well without a strong partnership, and uh, and every uh, instance of uh, strong uh, public schools or public higher education are based on the partnership. I I know that, uh, for example, in South Texas, we're getting better higher educational outcomes because of superintendents like Danny King. And we need to make sure that uh, uh, we we make this a statewide partnership instead of a, the kind of spotty level of partnership that currently occurs uh, all across the state. And I feel very strongly that Commissioner Williams will make that one of his uh, his big priorities. Uh, with that, uh, we'll uh, we'll move to uh, the next agenda item, ag agenda item five which is a presentation on ensuring the success of Latino males in higher education. Uh, let, let's, that slide, it was up there a minute ago. Would you go back to that, please? Okay, can you blow it up and take away? Th this is, this is, this to me is one of the most uh, significant slides. Uh, actually, you can see it on the screen better than you can on the monitors. Here's, here's uh, one of the, the fundamental challenges in, uh, in education, not just higher education, but throughout the educational pipeline. Look at the participation of females and males, particularly among Hispanic, uh, America, uh, Hispanics and African Americans. Uh, here's an interesting data point that a lot of people are unaware of. African American women have the highest level of participation in higher education of any ethnic subgroup. 
and you can see what it, you can see what it is. Our state goal is to have 5.7 percent of every ethnic group involved in higher education in Texas. And notice that African American females, 8.7 percent of African American women are enrolled in higher education. Once again, it's higher than the state average, and it's higher than our goals. But look at the participation of, of African-American males. It's 5.3 percent below our goal of 5.7. Notice that for Hispanics, females are under our goal. But look at the participation of Latino males, 3.8 percent which will have devastating consequences for the Texas economy and for the quality of life in Texas unless we raise that number dramatically. Now, we've heard all kinds of reports about how uh, the reasons for this and uh, people like John McWhorter have talked about uh, how we have to change some of the intrinsic values in African-American culture and Latino culture to make learning and make academic achievement seem cool. But there's no bigger educational challenge in Texas than to raise the participation of males in higher education. By the way, the participation of white males is below our, our goal. So it's an endemic problem across all groups, but it's particularly severe for uh, African-American and Latino males. And we have, a, uh, we have a guest today who's going to explain to us what he's doing to address the issue of Latino males, uh, uh, Professor Victor Sines, who's a professor of educational administration at UT Austin. And so, Victor, uh, welcome, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So thank you again for helping to uh, set the context and, and establish the uh, urgency uh, of this particular issue. So I, I do see some familiar faces on the council, and, and some of you I've just met today, or I hope to meet today. Uh, but uh, but again, once again, I appreciate this opportunity. So I, I want to start by addressing this issue of what the conversation nationally has been on boys over the last few years to help set the context. I think it's important to start sort of big picture on this issue. And, and, and I want to chronicle specifically some of the popular media outlets that are beginning to uh, focus their attention on this issue. Now this has been going on for, uh, I would say, five to eight years now. And in this particular case, and the commissioner kind of hit it uh, in his uh, closing comment there, um, we're starting to see this issue now affect the majority population. As you see here, the faces here are all Caucasian males. And so it's now reason, reaching a point of sort of a critical mass or resonance with respect to the larger conversations around gender inequity in this country. And uh, on top of that, what we've seen over the last couple of years now is a very concerted effort on the part of some prominent national organizations in this case, the College Board and their Advocacy and Policy Center, led by Vice President Ron Williams, who has uh, ushered in a new era there at the College Board of naf national advocacy on this particular issue as it affects men of color in higher education. So he's worked really hard uh, along with his, uh, well, outgoing president now, Gaston Caperton, to shed light, to be that national locus of advocacy on this issue uh, of men of color, to help continue to raise the stakes of conversation. Uh, conversation that to this point for the most part has been uh, framed around sort of very negative deficit type of tones around the experiences of, of young urban males, uh, primarily African American and Latino males. The work I've been doing the last few years has been more, uh, more sort of to the point to the urgency and the demographic reality of a state like Texas or for that matter the rest of the country in the very near future. And that is the plight facing Latino males as they matriculate or not matriculate as it were through their educational pipeline. But I want to start with this, con with this broad context to give you a sense of what the conversations have been, because they have been ongoing. And, uh, and ultimately, uh, I'll acknowledge in a little while that you know, the coordinating board has been very, very uh, proactive in, in making this issue a statewide imperative, uh, codified into the 2010 revision of Closing the Gaps. And I want to sort of tip my hat to the, to the uh, commissioner, to his leadership, of course, to the coordinating board uh, for, for, uh, for making this issue 
issue, putting this issue on the table as a significant policy imperative for the state of Texas. Uh, part of that sort of imperative has shaped the, the reasons that I'm, address, I'm addressing this work currently as a researcher at UT Austin. But I'm not doing it alone. I'm doing it with a, with a whole host of partners across the state, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to share that here shortly. But I'll start also by saying that this notion of a male crisis in education continues to be uh, sort of fly below the national radar of our attention and our consciousness. And part of it is there's still a lot of skepticism around embracing any sort of boy or male agenda in this country. You know, we still have a long way to go with respect to reaching gender equity or parity, and we still have things like the persistent wage gap, which is still 78 cents on the dollar in 2012. It's about 82 cents on the dollar here in Texas with respect to what women earn as compared to male, controlling for education and experience. So there's some persistent gender inequities uh, that, that we still have some work to do on. And uh, we've ushered in 30, 40 years worth of federal and state policies designed to help level the playing field. As a result of that focus on gender equity in terms of education and employment outcomes, uh, we've neglected somewhat what's happening with our boys, in particular our boys of color, and in particular within this sort of growing demographic reality of a state like Texas and the rest of the country. And ultimately, what it equates down to is a gender gap, a growing gender gap. So what is that gender gap? I'm going to show you some data to help illustrate that point, in particular around these metrics, these key metrics that all of us care about with respect to finishing high school, getting into college, and ultimately earning a degree and joining the workforce. So uh, a national data, this is federal data looking at 18 to 24-year-olds, uh, we can see that Right around 1990, the two lines here with respect to higher education participation began to diverge uh, for males and females. And a similar trend is evident also for, in this case, the comparison group white males and females, again, to the point we raised earlier. So this is endemic to the broader society here. It's not specific or unique to the Latino community or the African American community. We're seeing it across the board, across all various groups. Uh, this is in higher ed participation. Now, if we look at the output um, in terms of degree attainment, uh, in 2010, of all the associates or bachelor's degrees earned by Hispanics in this country, uh, better than three out of five were earned by Hispanic females. Right? So this is a trend now that we have seen um, develop over the last 20 or 30 years, roughly from the early 1990s when I first went to college, uh, and we're seeing continue to grow uh, over the last 20, 30 years. Um, so. We're seeing this evident both at the two-year college level as well as at the four-year college level. Now, bringing it closer to our state context, um, you know, here's data from uh, from the cohort, seventh grade cohort from 1998. And in reading through the minutes earlier, I noticed that uh, that Mr. Granger was here last last meeting from the Houston Endowment and shared the report uh, that they commissioned with NCHEMS. And so they highlighted the use of this data uh, in looking and in tracking, in that case, an eighth grade cohort all the way from 1998 to present day. And so this is a very comparable cohort here, again, statewide data that, that illustrates yet again, uh, in this case, the proportion of all African American and Hispanic males that were seventh graders in 98 that eventually either grad enrolled in, in some form of higher education. And you can see the statewide average was just over half of all students, but for Hispanic males, it's well below that as it is for African American males. Now, more to the point, then this is that report from NCHIMS, the new measure of educational success in Texas. Um, the, the, the very interesting thing they did, and again, this is a, a, a report based on the statewide data set, right? The entire statewide data system uh, that the legislature put into place to help um, streamline K-12 to higher education to workforce data at the unit level, at the student level. So in mining that data set, they began to disaggregate by some of these key trends. And again, following that same eighth grade cohort from 96, 98, uh, in this case, 11 years later, uh, you can see that the, the, the statewide averages for all male eighth graders uh, at 100% of eighth Eighth graders ultimately only 47.9 enroll in some form of post-secondary education, and only 16% earn a higher ed credential within 11 years. Um, so, if we compare that to Latino male eighth graders and Black male eighth graders, you can see those numbers are much more dire. So, again, the point here being ultimately, I want to illustrate where the gaps are, the fact that in, in a state like Texas, they're perhaps even more poignant, and as a result, there's greater urgency around being responsive to this new reality. Now, 
that really begs the question around, you know, what is going on with our boys? What is happening to our boys that is resulting in these very sort of dire, sobering statistics at the end of the educational pipeline? And in the work that I've been doing in canvassing uh, my colleagues that do work in early childhood development all the way through secondary and post-secondary education success, you know, we have to consider the broader portrait of challenges that face young boys uh, as they matriculate through uh, their educational pathways. Beginning with the, the uh, high stakes era of, 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 of testing and accountability here in this state that we helped to usher for the rest of the nation over the last 20 years. So it's resulted in a sort of culture of testing as we know, and I, know, I realize this is not the the session to be discussing that, but that has certainly created a certain environment with respect to our elementary education classrooms in the state of Texas. Uh, on the opposite end of this uh, chart, you see that uh, point here about teaching ranks. So in the nation, we've seen over 30 years now, the teacher workforce is now 85% white female, a significant change over the last 30 years in terms of the makeup uh, of the teacher ranks or teacher core. Uh, and as a result of that, the classrooms that many of our boys are, uh, are matriculating through tend to be populated by, by such teaching. And as a result, also, we don't see reflected uh, teachers in any sort of critical mass unless you grew up in different parts of the state like I did in, in, in the Rio Grande Valley uh, that is not sort of reflective of that community. So um, the research on, on teaching is key here because it's not to to say that somehow male teachers are better than female teachers or Latino teachers better than non-Latino teachers at educating these kids, but there isn't enough of a critical mass of teacher core to really uh, bring to bear any definitive uh, empirical evidence on, on these uh, assumptions that we're making about those early childhood classrooms. We do know that boys and girls learn very differently. We do know uh, that this era of accountability has ushered in a one-size-fits-all approach, has diminished the role of, of creativity and innovation in terms of teaching methodology and pedagogy. So as a result of that, it's creating a very constricted uh, pedagogical paradigm that many of our boys are matriculating through. Now, the last two points there at the top I want to highlight, because these are really key, and I think they speak to the larger uh, endemic and systemic challenges at work, and that is the continual over-representation of Latino and African-American boys in the special education ranks, uh, and also their continuing over-representation in the school discipline pipeline. Now, two years ago, the Council on State Governments, uh, the Justice Center, authored a report utilizing the same statewide data system that I, that I spoke about earlier. And in that report, they, 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 they found that, you know, for black and Latino boys, adolescent boys, uh, they're significantly more likely than their peer groups to ultimately experience some form of what we call discretionary discipline. And the category discretionary discipline is important because these are not mandatory offenses like a kid bringing a knife to school. These are discretionary, meaning the adult, the educator, the professional interprets the existing school discipline policy. In those discretionary cate categories, black and Latino boys are significantly overrepresented, significantly statistically overrepresented. Right, upwards of 85% of African American boys in their study have experienced uh, either one suspension or one expulsion uh, from 7th grade all the way to 12th grade. The rate is about 78% for Latino boys. Now, the other finding that's really key here is that ultimately boys that were expelled or suspended were three times more likely the following year to end up in the juvenile justice system. Three times more likely. And we know ultimately from there that leads to twice more likely joining uh, and, and committing some sort of serious felony to end up in the in the in the real criminal justice system. So we can start looking at these data and the overrepresentation in special education. Uh, again, the data on there highlight the fact that boys of color, Latino and African American boys, are again significantly overrepresented in the kinds of categories uh, that are sort of the behavioral, uh, developmental challenges, etc. Overrepresented relative to the general population. So these are trends we cannot ignore with respect to how uh, our school so schooling systems across the country are serving or perhaps uh, disservicing the needs of these boys as they try to mat matriculate through. Now, ultimately, in arriving a summary of the entire K-12 experience, um, 
and I can certainly keep going on with the sobering nature of these statistics, but I want to highlight that many of these symptoms are systemic and structural in nature and not a deficit of the boy or a problem of the boy, but rather the set of support structures that are failing these boys, that are pushing them out of the classrooms because teachers may be unable to di properly diagnose certain developmental needs or perhaps not wanting to deal with these boys. And certainly we have to draw those uh, speculations and conclusions because of their persistent and over-representation in special education in the school discipline categories on and on and on. And ultimately arriving at some really dire stats around our prison, uh, our adult prison population in this country, which I certainly don't want to, don't have to get into, but it, yet another persistent reality here facing our boys. Now once they arrive in college, and this is now the work that I've been engaged in here in Texas the last couple of years, we're finding some persistent challenges, given that they are uh, resilient all the way through, but that yet they still arrive with some significant problems around what we call help-seeking behaviors. Uh, so the way that we continue to socialize these boys um, is to uh, ultimately strip away uh, any sense of uh, confidence around asking questions or asking for help, because that's ultimately a threat to their masculinity or a threat uh, to their identity as males. And so th this manifests itself in, in some behaviors that may be at odds with their success once they arrive in college. And this is some of the, the data we've been looking at uh, more recently in talking to community college Latino male students in Texas, as well as uh, males in four-year colleges. They have difficult finding a sense of a space, a safe space on a college campus, a, a finding an affinity to a specific group or whatnot. Part of that is a result of underrepresentation, but ultimately also about how uh, receptive and responsive our higher ed campuses are being to providing these nurturing spaces uh, for these young men. So there's this persistent cultural mismatch, the, the, the types of academic expectations that, that are laid upon them that don't square well with the way they've been, tr they've been socialized around what it means to be successful, what it means to be uh, male, in particular Latino male. Uh, the role of family in, in adjusting to college also uh, is emerged as a very important theme um, across the board. And we spoke to over, and I want to get to it here, over 200 males um, at community colleges and four-year colleges across the state. An um, important theme that emerged over and over again was the saliency of, the, of a female figure in their life about uh, being the, the primary reason why they're choosing college. Uh, either the mother or some other female figure, uh, a partner, life partner, et cetera. But the role of mothers was really a positive force. You know, an, an interesting quick anecdote, I was visiting South Texas College uh, for our study, and we had just finished a day-long worth of focus groups and interviews with young men. And leaving the campus that evening, SDC was hosting a, uh, uh, a sort of college readiness summit for the local community. And wouldn't you know, I saw a mother literally pulling her eighth grade boy into the college to learn more about the college application process, financial aid, et cetera. So here we saw literally this finding come to life before our very eyes, our research team was walking out. The other piece, though, this is, this is really key, and this is part of my sensibilities as a Latino scholar, um, that, that really is a difficult one to, to address, and that's the persistent role of fathers, and in particular as a pull factor for many of these young men, right? Because they, you know, many of the men we spoke with uh, come from working class or low-income backgrounds. So the pressure they feel to work, to, to meet obligations to family, uh, which are honorable uh, obligations and responsibilities, to be sure, uh, but nonetheless, sometimes those pressures and that, those expectations, which are reinforced primarily by father or father figures in their lives, uh, an uncle, sometimes even the mother, um, are, are really a key obstacle for many of these young men to ultimately finish. Right? So that pressure to work, and granted, the more and more it costs to go to college, the more that opportunity cost goes up as well. So that, that continues to be part of the challenge we're going to have as educators as we look to, if we, if we have made this issue a statewide imperative, how are we, our educational institutions, our social uh, community institutions responding to these realities on the ground for many of these young men, whether it be Latino, African American, white, you name it. Uh, these are realities I think that you, we can ultimately transpose to these other groups as well to some degree. But they were particularly salient among the many Latino males that we spoke with. Now, I know I only have about five minutes left and, and I want to talk briefly about how I am responding um, in, in partnership with so many other institutions across the state. So we've developed something called Project MALES. MALES is an acronym for Mentoring to Achieve Latino Educational Success. The primary focus of this initiative, folks, is to 
directly addresses this uh, new statewide imperative around the challenges facing our uh, boys, boys of color, uh, as they matriculate through their process. So we have uh, embraced a pretty ambitious research agenda supported by uh, some local partners here, TG in particular, over the last two years. But we're taking everything we're learning and directing it towards the development of a mentoring effort, because that's ultimately all the research around, uh, particularly for boys of color, keeps saying over and over that you have to have these positive role models. As much as that might sound like a cliche to develop yet another mentoring program, the reality is many of these young men do not have healthy male adult figures in their lives. They have nothing but unhealthy male figures in their life. It might be a parent, it might be a cousin, a peer, whatever it might be. Uh, so we have to continue to stem the tide of that negativity with, with opportunities to, to place these young men in front of and, and, and to interact with positive forces in their lives. So we're embracing this idea of mentoring and in particular a near peer strategy of mentoring because we feel the best form of mentoring is often males that are not that much older than these young boys. So uh, we, we're in the process of, of developing some of those uh, uh, mentoring curriculum right now at the University of Texas. So I, I talked earlier about this statewide study and I wanted to give you a sample of the, the institutions that participated in that because they did indeed straddle the entire state, both two-year and four-year colleges. And many of these institutions you, you will recognize as uh, types that are already pushing the envelope, being innovative, trying new approaches to these response, uh, the, the emerging statewide uh, policy priorities. And, uh, and so I have begun a, an effort now to leverage this statewide network of institutions uh, that has answered the call set forth by, by, by the commissioner and by the Closing the Gaps report to make this a statewide imperative. Uh, and each in their own way have, have already begun very concerted and proactive efforts to start male mentoring or male focused initiatives, success initiatives at their respective campuses. I was at Tarrant County College uh, two, weeks o two weeks ago visiting with Chancellor Hadley and uh, they just received a Title III grant to start a system or district-wide set of male mentoring initiatives across all their campuses just to give you an idea and that's one of the members of this uh, burgeoning consortium that we're developing. And lastly I'll say that we, we are now leveraging this consortium uh, in a a very strong way. I just received a word a week and a half ago from Dr. Wynn Rosser, the Greater Texas Foundation. Uh, GTF is going to fund a, a Texas Higher Ed Consortium on Male Student Success that we're leading out of UT Austin to the tune of $700,000. Uh, UT Austin is stepping up in a big way to, to serve as that, uh, to provide that statewide infrastructure. And, and I had the, the, the great privilege of, of sitting down with the commissioner and his staff just three weeks ago to describe this new initiative as we continue to look for innovative ways to, to leverage the expertise that exists on the ground at, across the entire state of Texas here to bring to bear on this new statewide imperative uh, to focus on males of color, in particular Latino males. So we'll continue to utilize this uh, important statewide network uh, to be responsive to this, uh, this new reality that we're facing with. I, and, and ultimately, what I want to focus on is, uh, I'll leave you with a couple of uh, examples of promising programs that are that, that we have uh, come across in our work in our research work and now more 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 recently in our programmatic work um, several initiatives across the state of Texas so for example fathers active in communities and education uh, is a program that started in South Texas Alfonso Rincon is the uh, director of that effort that came to be through a gear up grant uh, about eight nine years ago and they work directly with school districts and colleges in South Texas uh, primarily in the Kingsville and Corpus Christi area uh, to, to put on a variety of different programming, all designed to to get the father directly involved in the teaching and learning process during the school day. Many of these kids don't see their, their, their father until you know after school, if at all. And, and uh, so this is a really innovative uh, curriculum that they've developed to help infuse the father directly into the school day. And I know Alfonso has gotten a lot of uh, publicity, positive publicity around their efforts and collaborations with multiple partners. The XY Zone is a program, a boys program started here in Central Texas by communities and schools. They started 12 years ago, initially as a gang rehabilitation program, but they've since ex uh, extended to about 10 different high schools that CIS serves in the local area, partnering with AISD, with Bastrop, with Maynard, with uh, Hayes County, I mean several other local ISDs, but ultimately this, this curriculum that they've developed is about helping these young men who are not going to be your top 10% type or for that matter, uh, you know, anywhere uh, within the category of college going. Uh, but nonetheless, 
to help usher them through through manhood, through the healthy and responsible uh, sort of development of their masculine identity. And uh, because CIS is national, they have the ability to ultimately scale up. And we're working very uh, proactively with them to, to, to do that through some grant making here over the next few years. Uh, and then last but not least here, Encuentro is in, in San Diego County. Uh, and again, this is a public-private initiative that came together um, to, uh, to build a summer leadership academy, again, responding to the emerging reality on the ground for so many of these community partners that they felt uh, better to, to better prepare these young males for, uh, for a responsible and productive citizenry uh, and, and citizenship uh, to produce strong leaders, et cetera. So we, we continue to work and, uh, and proactively to raise awareness around these issues, to bring to bear some data and research that might help us to shape responses uh, to this issue. And, uh, and ultimately, I want to conclude by saying that there is a lot of good news here. In light of the doom and gloom, sort of sobering nature of many of these data that I shared, uh, many national and state organizations have taken notice and are responding. I mentioned College Board, but I can rattle off the list of other national entities that, that are all familiar to, to you folks. At the state level, I mentioned that the, the Coordinating Board has been very key in, in establishing this as a statewide imperative, and I cannot stress enough how important that has been. Uh, certainly in my interactions with institutions up and down the state, uh, they look to that as being a key, um, uh, a key instigate, instigator and, and um, uh, encouraging force for them to address this issue. Uh, and then finally, where do we go from here? We got to think about obviously continuing to raise awareness. Part of what we're doing here, part of what I'm, the reason I was invited here is to share some of this work, but ultimately to leverage the the, the tools that we have as researchers to bring to bear uh, important new findings around these sets of issues that, that we can translate then into action. Uh, I thank you for your time, and I look forward to having uh, some fruitful discussion. Members, uh, questions? Yes, Bill. You know, very good report, wonderful. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, very interesting report and some great data that you presented. Uh, you know, the, the partners and the examples you're giving at the, at the conclusion, uh, do you have any data on the success rates of those programs. There's so many great programs out there, and, and a lot of this is anecdotal right. rather than, than that they've had a, an impact or increased the, the college going rates by 10 percent. Or right. Do we have any of, of that kind of data? Great question, President Flores, and, and I think it allows me to, to reinforce the point here about this issue. And you'll notice that I call these promising programs. I didn't call them best practices because they are unproven. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in fact, that's part of the challenge here, that here we are, 2012, uh, in a state that's about to become majority Hispanic, and the, the body of evidence around the plight facing Latino male students is non-existent. Mm -hmm. And that's a really depressing reality. Uh, and I said, I said uh, on my humble journey as a, as a junior faculty member uh, to bring my skill set to bear on this issue, uh, and I found some willing partners in the college board uh, through the coordinating board now. I didn't mention, but the coordinating board is, is partially funding our efforts to Project Males, and we're beginning the process of collecting that, uh, that evidence that ultimately will reinforce uh, the utility of these concepts and structures so that we can look to scaling up. Uh, but uh, that, that, that is definitely a, a significant challenge we're facing, that given that demographic reality and the fact that our boys continue to lag behind, you saw the data, those trend lines are diverging, ladies and gentlemen. They're not, you know, they're not leveling off. They're continuing to diverge. Uh, you know, th this is a significant area where more scholarship, uh, more research is needed. And, uh, and the reality is, and I don't have to tell you folks, that the foundations right now are more interested in funding direct services to students. And that's part of the reason why I've had to translate and shift my strategy towards mentoring efforts. And then on the back end, building in evaluation and assessments that allow for us to be able to collect that research uh, uh, data and evaluation data that we can then uh, make some definitive claims about these programs. Uh, but the XY Zone, I know, is partnering currently with uh, some professors in social work here at UT Austin, they're starting to build their evaluation, um, um, you know, uh, approach to, to their efforts, uh, both mixed method, qualitative and quantitative approaches at collecting survey data from some of these students. Uh, my, my partnership with the XY Zone, I didn't mention, but Project Mails is directly partnering with the XY Zone now. Uh, our mentoring
mentoring efforts are plugged directly into their students. So we're working right now uh, with two high schools in Austin, uh, Lanier and Travis High School, but we look to scale up to all 10 of their XY Zone high schools here in the next year. Uh, again, reliant upon soft money. I mean, you know, just to be completely candid with, with all of you, that these are the kinds of efforts that are still not uh, supported in any sort of statewide level, uh, aside from the, the support we just got from the coordinating board uh, to fund our, our pilot mentoring effort here. Um, you know, we have yet to really have a serious conversation about translating this new statewide imperative into program, programs and services and initiatives that can be institutionalized both at K-12 and higher education. But again, part of the, the, the Part of the process of getting there is building that evidence. So I'm kind of in a catch-22 here. You know, we're trying to work hard to build that evidence, trying to identify research dollars and, and other source resources to, to build that evidentiary basis to then say uh, that these are proven programs, empirically driven, built within this culture of evidence that so many of our our, uh, our institutions have to rely upon now. Uh, but to your to bottom line, these are still unproven models, and uh, which is why I call them promising quite frankly, and, and we, we have to continue to work hard to build that evidence. Yes. I'd just like to commend you on an excellent presentation. And to the question about empirical evidence of whether or not these types of programs work, uh, just to mention that the What Works Clearinghouse, uh, which is attached to the U.S. Department of Education, um, as on an ongoing basis conducts a very rigorous evaluations of evaluations of dropout programs and looks at those that meet their very high standards with substantial or significant results and then looks at those um, programs that have shown significant results to see if there's any common threads. And there are four, and one of those four is mentoring. And so I think while there may not be specific evidence currently available for these programs, I definitely think there is evidence out there that shows the strategy you're employing is um, definitely supported by the evidence and research. Well, for you know the project, project mails to your point, uh, Dr. Lindsay, me mentoring is in our name, and uh, on project mails, and we've definitely approached that strategy uh, purposefully, uh, recognizing that the, many of these young boys are, are needing some positive figures in their lives to to break through the the. Uh, the noise of negativity, unfortunately. And I don't want to get too much into the, the deficit, cultural deficit uh, reactions that, that so many uh, may, may get into with respect to why are these boys struggling, what's going on, you know, why are they not uh, motivated, why are they not successful. I, I think what I, what I want the takeaway to be is that there's a broader set of systemic challenges here. The data on, on special education overrepresentation, which, by the way, the Office of Civil Rights has been tracking for over 30 years at the federal level. It's not a new phenomenon. We've known this data for decades. Uh, the overrepresentation in disciplinary categories, I mean, that speaks to the way that we are training our teachers to be responsive to needs of students in the classroom, to not just want to kick these, and I'm speaking as a former classroom teacher myself in South Texas, to not just want to get these guys out of the class, because I mean that is a mentality, if I can speak really candidly, about what is going on with so many of our boys. The fact that our teacher core is not reflective of the broader population, that's a challenge. That means that many of these life experiences that maybe uh, male teachers such as myself might have are not reflected among the critical mass of teachers that are in these classrooms. Um, ultimately, you know, there's a whole set of, of, of interventions here. And we've heard uh, the Obama administration discuss this need for diversifying our teacher workforce. Uh, we've heard the calls at the local level, at the state level as well. But how are we responding to that in, with our set of policies, with what we are supporting in our legislature, with what ultimately messages we are giving to males uh, around the teaching profession? Because I tell you, there is a really strong stigma around uh, any adult male who wants to work with young kids. That's a strong stigma, in my view, that discourages so many well-intended adult males from ultimately pursuing teaching as a viable career pathway. 
And, and um, that's yet another challenge here around the increasing sort of feminization of the teaching profession, or for that matter, uh, the educational workforce. And, uh, and I think in dealing with these issues and in, in, in the research we're collecting, we're grappling with sort of the, the, the frameworks around masculinity and how these men in college make sense of their identity, because ultimately that affects the kind of career pathways they choose, that affects the kind of life decisions they choose for themselves in terms of family formation, and in terms of community building, et cetera. And, and so a lot of what needs to happen also is ultimately among the, the adult males within our communities. And that's yet another sort of difficult conversation that needs to continue to happen. And it's not just a problem or a challenge for the Latino community. It's not just a challenge for the African-American community. This is, we're all in. And I think, you know, folks like Dr. Murdoch and others have been saying that for decades. We are all in. And this should not be just an, uh, an issue that we are responding to from within these sort of smaller community subgroups. This is a larger issue that ultimately portends uh, to the future economic and social prosperity of our state and our nation. And I think the fact that systema systematically so many of our boys are falling and lagging behind, ultimately those... Uh, you know, we will reap what we sow in, in terms of our future economic opportunities. Drew, you had a question. So in the um, adjusting to college, do you find a difference between first generation, second generation? Well, yes and no. And, 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 and I'll use that as an opportunity to circle back to a um, uh, discussion of uh, findings and recommendations here. And some of the fonts somehow got uh, messed up here. But what we, what, we, what we are observing among the population of students that we've uh, interviewed and, and, and we continue to collect data on is a set of challenges are, are well known. And, and so I'll, I'll list on the, on the left-hand side here, you see all the pressing challenges that so many of our males in, in this case, in community colleges are, are articulating. Uh, peer influence, family financial responsibilities, the, the complex influence of pride, uh, machismo, if you will, uh, those are continuing themes that are specific to all males, regardless of whether they're first generation or second generation. Now, when you ask generation, do you mean immigrant or do you mean first in college? Im immigrant. Immigrant. You know, and, I, and I'll concede that in our, in our research protocol, we didn't appropriately distinguish in, in terms of their generational, immigrant generational status. Uh, we did collect some, you know, profile data on each of our uh, participants, and we're in the process still of, of, uh, of uh, you know, combing through some of that data. But uh, so to answer your question directly, I, we have yet to, to really pick up on any generational difference, but that's partly because we just haven't begun that process yet. Uh, but, but overarching uh, the themes here, I think, spoke to the, the common set of experiences that we heard up and down the state, two-year and four-year colleges, and, and, and ultimately feeling a, a, a persistent disconnect with this idea of being a college student and what that meant for a young Latino male, whether at a community college or a four-year college. And so that, again, speaks to how responsive, how welcoming our campuses are being to these young men who are already averse to seeking out help, averse to going to office hours and meeting faculty, sitting in the back of the classroom, all those behaviors that we know are, uh, are partly symptomatic of a much larger set of disengagement that they feel about education in general. And again, these are males in college classrooms, not the ones that have opted out. We're not even talking to those as part of our work. Uh, so yet another big gap in terms of what we know or don't know about you know, these young men and, and matriculating through education. Other questions? I, 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 have, I have several questions. Um, First of all, um, I was struck by several comments. You talked about the feminization of the teaching profession. Is it more feminized than it was 40 years ago than when males uh, outrepresented uh, right. women in terms of academic achievement and going to college and graduating high school and so forth? So 30 years ago, the teacher workforce was approximately 70, 65 to 70 percent female. Well, I'm talking about even farther. But I'm talking about my generation. Well, I never had a, I never had a male teacher in either elementary school or high school. In a one-room schoolhouse. Well, <laughs> <laughs> without heat. Right. 
So if we, if we circle back to about 30 years ago in the early 1970s, I guess that's 40 years ago, um, you know, that ushered in the era of Title IX, uh, of broader opportunities for women in education, in, in the workforce. And uh, it's around that time that we started seeing a shift in the teacher workforce as well, the broader educational professional workforce. Um, so to your point about what's happened, and, you know, I think a lot has happened since the 1970s, and I'm not a history professor, but uh, I have taught uh, courses in social student movements from that era. And, and I know that, uh, you know, our gender norms have changed dramatically. Um, obviously, uh, the, the makeup of our family structure has changed dramatically during that time. Um, and uh, But the, the concentration or lack thereof of, of males in the teacher workforce has uh, dropped by more than half. And more than that, they tend to be overrepresented in the secondary education level, grade levels. And we also know, by the way, that male teachers tend to be fast-tracked for administrative uh, opportunities. So when you do have male teachers, let's say, as a, as a PE coach in, third, you know, in, in elementary school, you know, often they're, they're, because they are in the min numerical minority, there are additional burdens placed on those, uh, those male teachers or educators, and ultimately they're pushed, uh, pushed along the administrative uh, track. But you know, what has changed, that has changed. There's been some broader societal changes with respect to our gender norms and expectations, with respect to uh, dual earners and, and families. Um, the fact that, uh, you know, so many of our boys of color now, growing up in uh, families without a father, without a biological father, that raises about 40% right now nationally of boys of color growing up in a household without their biological father. Well, I would, I would argue that that's, that's a more significant phenomenon than the feminization of the, of the uh, teaching profession. I think if you, if you looked at American education historically, uh, going all the way back to the, the beginnings of public education in the 19th century, I think you would, you would see, uh, I, in my own days as a scholar, I looked at some of these issues, I, I think you would see that, that uh, the uh, teaching profession was overwhelmingly female, and yet up until the, the 70s, uh, men still outperformed uh, women in school, still went to college in, in uh, higher going rates when the teaching profession was even more feminized than it is now. Because I think if you go back prior to 1970, it may well be that the teaching profession was 90% women, and yet men were still outperforming women. And I would argue that, that probably the most important factor was the, 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 the growing absence of, of male figures in the home that places a greater burden on the schools to respond to the needs of boys. Uh, the, the, other, the other question I, 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 another question I had was, you, you talk about uh, you talk about things like uh, disproportionate uh, availability of, of resources, unequal distribution of school funding, underprepared teachers, high teacher turnover, uh, the flight of affluent families, poor leadership. But those affect girls as as well as as well as boys. Right. And yet, African American females attend higher education greater numbers. Than, than any other group. Right. How do you how do you explain that discrepancy? I, I, I don't disagree with that. That's absolutely right. That, you know. So, and, I, and I'll come back to one of my slides here around uh, understanding better the resiliency of of Latinas, let's say. And so, there's a body of research that has emerged on this over the last 20 years because of uh, these this emerging trend of more women coming to college, but in particular for African American and Latina female students. So, I think what what we've learned from looking at that work, because you're right, they're still in those same contexts uh, with respect to their K-12 schooling experiences, but the, the difference has to do with the levels of self-efficacy, uh, with the fact that they come to college with, with exceedingly high degree aspirations, uh, you know, and, and they maintain those aspirations throughout, through, throughout their, the, their, their experience. Um, as a result of these uh, shifting gender norms within the Latino community, within all communities, 
Um, more and more women are now feeling better supported about going to college. They see going to college when, when you still have a family or home context that is very traditional in nature. And I grew up in an area where that is absolutely the case. And you know, Dr. King could speak to that as well in his interaction with many, many families whose fathers will not allow their daughters to leave the valley and go to college. Uh, my, my, my wife is a prime example, if I could use that anecdote, of somebody who had to literally leave her home to go to college. We met here at UT Austin. I wouldn't have met the wonderful woman if she hadn't done that. Uh, her sister had a full right to Yale, and she was not allowed to go. A full right to Yale and was not allowed to go. So for women, you know, for especially high-achieving young Latinas in places like South Texas, but you can juxtapose that experience across other contexts around the state, um, they see going to college as a way to break away from those very entrenched gender norms within the Latino community. It's not to say that it's bad or evil or whatnot. That's part of the challenge, part of the resiliency that they have to exhibit and exert in order to achieve. Now, for boys, what do we know about boys uh, with respect to the way we raise boys? We know that they, um, especially within the Latino community, and obviously the fact that, that mothers play a key role was not necessarily a surprise to me because we know that boys are, as we say in my community, los consentidos, you know, the favorites, especially if you're the oldest. Uh, you, you're, you're overly coddled. You're, you know, we, we socialize boys in ways that are very insulating with respect to their uh, the ability to engage the world around them. And, and we give them a pass. And we have this attitude of boys will be boys. And, and that's not specific to the Latino community. I'm not making that generalization. I think we can make that case for a lot of different communities. But ultimately, what does that produce? That produce, produces young men that are ill-equipped uh, as compared to their female counterparts to to face adversity and overcome it. Whereas young women are seeing college as a way to overcome that adversity that they feel within their home culture, within those gender norms that play out every day. Uh, and again, those are especially salient for young kids coming from these working class or low income backgrounds where you're more apt to find these very entrenched traditional gender norms. And uh, And I think the body of research on Latinas has really focused a lot on these resiliency uh, uh, factors that, that play a lot into their decision making about why they want to excel so much both in high school and ultimately translate that into high achieving, high self-efficacy, high degree aspiration uh, female students coming to college. And the difference there is that boys are simply not meeting that same level uh, of uh, of, uh, of factors and resiliency traits that, that our female students are exhibiting. And, and so how do we build that? I mean, that's part of the mentoring uh, curriculum that we're developing in learning what we can for how, how young women are doing, why w young women are doing so well. And by the way, you know, if we look at the data, Latinas still lag behind their, their f white female peers too. So there's still more room to grow there, absolutely. But the trend lines nonetheless are positive, even controlling for population growth. They're still on the way up. There's a positive slope there. Uh, so it is, uh, it is uh, reassuring to some degree. And, uh, but ultimately, we, we have a lot more work to do. And, and, and it comes down to having really difficult, frank conversations in our communities uh, with, with our K-12 partners, with, with families with community partners, you name it, about uh, the role of parents, the role of, of father and mother, the role of father, mother, father figure and mother figure if the biological parents aren't around or in the picture. And uh, the, I don't want to assign blame to the structure or the system or be that abstract because we can get into that debate all day long. Uh, you know, a lot of schools are underfunded. You know, yes, it's unfair and we continue to work hard to, as a state and as a country to, to, to correct those issues. But you're right, those issues affect all students. So what ultimately di separates uh, the students has to do with these resiliency factors about overcoming adversity. Yeah. Um, Can I, you, oh, yes, no, please. Dr. King, you were in the meeting when we were down doing the workforce, and the um, administrator for the doctor's hospital in Hidalgo County gave us a staggering uh, couple of statistics. One is their hospital alone is del they're delivering 800 babies a month, the equivalent of a middle school a month. And all of the hospitals in Hidalgo County together are basically delivering the equivalent of a 5A high school a month. So this is an issue that we better 
get a handle on because, as you said, what our population is doing, where the concentration is, is a big issue. Dr. King's doing a great job standing there, by the way. I've got I've got two more two more questions, uh, sir. Very very quickly, um, have have you or others done some research on the correlation between uh, for for all boys, but particularly for African American and Latino boys, the correlation between performing poorly in school, including dropping out of school altogether, and the absence of a male figure in the home. You know. I, I have not done that work. I know that there's some family researchers that look a lot at those specific issues. Uh, I know the data. I know the data is, is very dire. When you think about 30% of African-American boys growing up in a house without a father, without a biological father, um, about 40% of Latino boys, that's, I mean, that's the majority. Right? And that is a significant and staggering number. And so the questions and the consequences that anthropologists and sociologists and policymakers, all of us have to ask is what, what are the long-term consequences of this, these persisting trends? And it's not at all to dismiss or disrespect the important work that grandmothers and mothers have to do, because mothers are often mothers and fathers, grandmothers, you know, whatever it is, right? That's why mother figures and father figures, right? Uh, we look at the, the terminology there, are key. But what we know about raising healthy, uh, well-balanced uh, young kids is that there, there has to be balance, that they have to have positive influence both from female figures in their life as well as male figures in their life. So to the issue of what, you know, how the effect of a 85% teacher workforce being female, you know, many of these young boys, and to your issue, Dr. Perez, you know, they don't have a male teacher maybe up to 8th or ninth grade, if at all. So, you know, what does that mean about the kinds of positive male figures they have? If, they're not, if they don't have one at home, and, I, and we know the majority of them do not, if they don't see one at school, then ultimately where do they find them? They find those male figures in their life. And for many of these young boys, ultimately those are very unhealthy male figures, peers um, within their neighborhood or community uh, or other unfortunate figures in, in popular media, whatever it might be, but ultimately we can't take it for granted anymore and I feel uh, having these difficult conversations about the role of family and community, uh, as much as our, our national state politicians go on about local control, I can't think of a better local control issue than you know how it is we're raising our boys right now. Good. Uh, first, thank you for a great presentation on a very important topic, and this is more just some comments related to what's happening in the, I mean, the health and human services uh, agencies. Um, first, this disproportionality. Uh, one of the other areas that there's significant, historically has been significant disproportionality, has been in the child protective services, with the chances of a child being brought out of the, the family and put into uh, protective services or into foster care, much more, uh, much higher in the African American community than in other ethnic groups. And interestingly, it's independent of the racial background of the caseworker that's making that, that, that decision. Right. And so for the last decade or so, under the leadership of Joyce James, who now leads the, the, the Center for Dispropor Health Disparities and Disproportionality for the Health and Human Services Enterprise, they've had a pretty focused effort on changing that uh, and, and have, had ma have made a change uh, and you know, still challenged, but, but an area that they continue to have a major focus on and so might be somebody that would be worth you know, pulling into this, this type of dialogue. But the second point, um, after the last legislative session, there was direction to the Attorney General's office related to the involvement of fathers. Um, before the child is born, bringing in to make sure that fathers are involved during the pregnancy, are involved when the baby is born, so that there is the attachment there, that they, you know, there's some education of what it means to be a father. And uh, uh, again, that's been an initiative that's been going on for the last year or so under the direction of the Attorney General's office. Beautiful. One, one, uh, one, la one last question, uh, Victor. Uh, have, have you or any other researcher uh, corrected or for class, for socioeconomic characteristics. What, what, happens, what, what happens to uh, this, this uh, 
uh, this issue regarding uh, uh, male success in education. Right. If you take socioeconomic factors in, in a consideration, for example, do middle class Latino families, in terms of their the educational attainment of their of their boys, do they resemble other uh, white African American middle class right. families, or is there still a significant gap in the educational yeah. attainment? The data that we've looked at, Commissioner, uh, shows a persistent uh, gender gap uh, um, across socioeconomic status. Now, it, it definitely lessens as the, the further you go up because of the whole host of other factors that come into play. But I'll tell you, if we can look at the, uh, the example of University of Texas at Austin, which it has, for the most part, on average, a pretty affluent student body relative to other public institutions across the state, I think it would be a safe assumption to make. And even at UT Austin, we look at the data, African-American Latino males are, you know, again, lag behind all groups with respect to degree attainment, four-year, six-year graduation rates, well below the, 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 the university average. So, you know, that, that's a sort of microcosm at that level that exists and which becomes even more magnified as you look at a uh, two-year college on the border. Um, and, um, and so we do see it cut across all socioeconomic strata and across all racial ethnic groups. And in fact, we see it as a global phenomenon. I mean, this is not unique to the United States. We've seen a growing gender gap with respect to educational attainment in many countries across the world. Um, so there's a, sort of a larger set of trends here, and I'm not here to speculate about what, what, what's in the air of the water here, but, but, but ultimately uh, it's a consistent trend, and, and it ought to be a consistent worry, and I, and I hope that it is a consistent statewide imperative. Any, uh, any final questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, sir. Appreciate we it. will uh, follow your work uh, closely, and we wish you every success with it. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Let's move on to the, uh, the next uh, agenda item, which is a consideration of approval of the P-16 College Readiness and Success Strategic Action Plan 2012. And Dr. Judy Laredo from the Coordinating Board will make this presentation. Thank you, Commissioner and members of the panel. Since 2006, we have been required every two years to submit our plan and the work that we have done uh, over the two-year framework to the legislature in our work addressing college and career readiness to help students propel through the pipeline and avoid developmental education and move into credit-bearing courses. And so the plan uh, has been developed, and when I say developed, it's in response. Every year it is updated around the eight objectives that the plan was originally uh, written with. And to those objectives, what we have done is brought forth the update, and that is being presented to you. It is required that you approve it. It was presented to our uh, board, our committee of the board, in September, and it will also be going to the board at the end of this month for their approval before it is sent forward. There are also three recommendations within the document at the end uh, of the document that speak to the continuation of our work. Unfortunately, with the last legislative session, we lost funding with college and career readiness, as did TEA. And so we have continued to proceed with our work. We have projects that are funded through August of 2013 that have focused on the success of moving students through this pipeline to completion. We have learned a lot from the work that we have done since 2006, and a comprehensive evaluation has been done on all of our work, and that report will be ready after the first of the year to present to the board. So we have learned a lot from many of the initiatives that we have put in place. And so looking at the end of the report, looking at three of the recommendations that are put forth in here, because of all the work that has been done, especially around the college and career readiness standards, it is recommended that we go back and review those standards. Uh, periodically to ensure that those standards 
are what they should be and if any changes need to be made within that curriculum because the college and career readiness standards are now infused in the TEKS curriculum. They have been adopted by our board as well as the State Department of Education board. The second recommendation is because of our work around professional, around uh, developmental education and the work in the field around curriculum that we continue that professional development career work, especially as we're looking to move students through the pipeline so that there's a really clear understanding that when we move students out of the K-12 arena into the post-secondary arena, that it also very clearly means career, technical, or a four-year degree route. We do not assume that every child coming out of high school should go get a degree because we'd all be in pretty sad shape if we didn't have electricians, plumbers, mechanics, etc. And all students have different passions. They don't all want to have a degree. And we know that to be successful and a contributing member in society, you do not have to have a four-year degree. What you do have to have is a skill level leaving high school to make choices so that you can enter into the workforce if that's where you choose to go the first route and not uh, proceed into academic training, but it's the skills that students are needing once they leave high school. It's not the same world when you, uh, Mr. Temple, when you tease a commissioner about his school days, well, uh, I go back about the same amount of time and that curriculum that I learned was the same curriculum I was working with today. It would be a sad scenario for the people that work with me because I would be so far behind. So the world is different and we need much different skills for our students to make choices. And the last thing is we look around our work in developmental education under the leadership of uh, Dr. Suzanne morales Vale and her staff, Terry Daniels and Linda Munoz in, in ABE, we have learned a lot from the projects that have been funded. Uh, things that are working, things that are moving that needle and propelling more students into credit-bearing courses and not having to go the segue into developmental education. It is not fixed, but there are things that are working. And we now need professional development across the state to work with current faculties who are in this area to help them learn from those who have helped make those changes. And so those are three of the recommendations that are within this report that are also moving forward to the legislature. And that concludes my presentation, Commissioner. Well, uh, explain uh, to us why th this is an action item for the council and, and, and why we have it to It is required involved. under your uh, purview as the State P-16 Council to approve this because the original work of these objectives came via this route through the P-16 College Career Readiness Initiative. So we need your permission to move this forward as a report that is now going to the legislature of the work that has been done since since 2006, we've periodically updated it, and it's done jointly with TEA. It's not a single effort only on the coordinating board side. And since this is an action item that we have to take a vote on, I, I want to make sure that uh, I, I want to make sure that everyone uh, on the council understands uh, this uh, document and. Uh, has an opportunity to uh, ask questions. Uh, I, I call your attention to, uh, if you look on page seven, objective five, create a college going culture in every public kindergarten, elementary, middle and high school in Texas. Uh, this doesn't mean, because it, it, it has been interpreted inaccurately, this doesn't mean that we expect every child in Texas to go to college. No. This that means is that what we want to do is we want to create college-going cultures in schools so that children understand that going to college is a viable option for them. And that we want to give them, give all children a strong academic foundation as a way of maximizing their opportunities beyond school. Or as is, is, is Dr. Laredo pointed out, our college, our, our 
our standards in Texas are called college and career readiness standards. They're not simply college standards. That is correct. But we, we combine the two so that uh, students in high school and lower grades would recognize that going to college is an option along with others. For we, we know that for many, many years there were a lot of schools in Texas that did not present going to college as a viable option to their students. So this is simply intended to be one of number of options that are available to children. I think the other thing, too, Commissioner, to add is that uh, many times people don't understand that post-secondary education is the education we have after they leave high school. And when we talk about that college career readiness, our technical colleges in essence are a form of training. I mean, it's, that's a career pipeline for certificates in, in those technical fields, but it is beyond high school. And so that post-secondary arena is very broad. It is not always leading you to that four-year degree. It is leading to training. It is leading to certificates. It could be an associate's. It doesn't mean that university route. And I think that's something that we have to really stress and make clear clear so that people have a better understanding that that field is broad and it means that students who leave 12th grade need skills to make choices. Whatever their desire, their, their passion and their goal for their life needs to start with the skills so they can make those choices. Right. And I, when we first started this a long time ago, you know, we, we weren't talking about Work, workforce readiness and career readiness, so uh, we've moved a long way. And just a quick glance through here, I don't see, I see uh, college ready experts cited, but I, what I don't see is any input at all from the business community. And to operate an education system that's preparing people for career readiness and workplace readiness without the input of the business community and understanding their needs, I think we're missing a, a, a very important element. I scanned it real quick. I don't see employer or business at all represented unless they're under, under the umbrella of the one sentence that says, college ready experts. So I, that would be one thing that I would see missing to, to show the business community and to show the public that we are connected. If we're talking about career readiness, we are, we are understanding what the needs of this state are from a, a labor market. And that's uh, a good demand. point, and we can go back and correct that. But there are also four other reports of the work that has taken place within the division of P-16 initiatives that does include that ABE scenario. No, I'm not talking about you know, ABE. No, but I'm saying, yeah, but right, in our yeah. workforce training, there well, are... I'm talk, no, I'm talking about college curricula development career readiness. Okay. okay. You know, how, just, you know, no offense, how many social workers do we need? Or how many doctors do we need? Or how many um, history majors? Do we need? <laughs> and that is, and that I, your point is well taken, so, and we can go back and clarify that. Great labor that. market information that we use and y'all utilize, and I think that the message that we are taking that from an economic development standpoint, mm -hmm. just like the, the the presentation we had earlier, that's an economic development issue for this state. That's something we have to address if we're going to be, you know, a viable competitor in, in, the, in the world market and, and to be able to, to attract businesses here. Um, you know, good news is we have a very young population compared to the rest of the nation, but you just heard our challenges with a lot of that population. Okay. So I think it sends a great message to not only internally in the state, but for those looking at making investments in the state that, that we are taking those things in consideration. So above, uh, above and beyond the ABE world. And we can certainly go back and do that and, and make that a comment also to our board when they go to move it forward. Great, thank you. Yes. Is it, uh, is it urgent that we uh, approve this document today, or is there time for us to make the kinds of uh, edits and corrections that Larry referred to? It, goes to, it, to the, it goes to the uh, legislature by December the 1st. Okay. But we can certainly make that correction and send it out, and then so before, because our board meeting does not meet until the 25th. I mean, we can just approve it subject to subject to those revisions, yes. Those. And we okay. can, I can send it back. If everyone agrees. I just, it just, yeah. um, okay. And I, and, and I can, I, I can certainly, um, 
uh, assure the, the members of the council that we will make those corrections. Yeah. In fact, I'd be willing to send them to you, Larry, to, so that you can take a look at them. We can do that. That's not a problem. I think there's some places where it could really fit in well okay. and, and make the point. Okay. Well, what we can do is send this to you electronically where you have some thoughts, and if you would share that with us, we will make that those changes and then present that to our board as well. Any other uh, questions, Drew? So the connection between the recommendations in this item and uh, and then agenda item eight, what the, what's the connection between those two? Well, I, I think they're related because what we're talking about is is uh, proposals uh, that uh, we're going to uh, uh, talk about in regard to sending to the legislature. And obviously, there are some issues embedded in here that will be part of the uh, um, consideration of educational issues that come up in the next uh, legislative session. The, the, the issue that, uh, that, that Larry just referred to is, is going to be a, clearly going to be a, a very appropriate issue. What's, what's, the, what's the proper balance between workforce preparation and college preparation? And how do we make sure that uh, they they overlap appropriately? How do you infuse uh, work-ready skills throughout uh, the high school curriculum as well as infusing mm -hmm. college readiness skills? Uh, I, I think uh, we can turn to, to Danny for some advice on this because I know you've done quite well on in both regards in, in your school district. But that's that's going to be one of the major issues that we deal with in the legislative session. So uh, I think that uh, we will strike that, that proper balance. But uh, clearly that absence of balance in this document that Larry just referred to is something that's going to be a very important legislative issue. I guess what I'm asking is in, a, in, in discussion on eight, are there any of those items that we would want to include in the As recommendations in this? Right. That's, that's what I'm asking. Maybe I'm asking. Well, you, we could, or we could, as we look at our legislative agenda and coming forth with recommendations of things that we would like addressed as we move with this curriculum, that might, it might be a, a, another place to put it. Because when you send it forth, it's just this document just out to the legislature in general. We, we may, as you did, what, uh, two sessions ago, uh, Commissioner, with our work in adult basic education, that we put something separately forward. Well, Drew, how, how is this is a is a is a is a response to the issue that you've raised? Why don't we hold off taking a vote on approving this document with the suggested changes that Larry has already uh, recommended? Let's wait for your presentation, and then if you have other ideas that you would like to uh, place in this document, why don't we why don't we, we do take that. a vote after your presentation? on this document. Right. Does that make sense? Put them all into one. David? W one quick question. Uh, one of the reasons you asked me to be on this group was the interrelationship between health and academic achievement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I guess my question here is those health issues, again, quick scan, you know, there's, there's no comments related to that the, the healthy child is the successful you know, child. Is there a way to in the, the current objectives to, to add some language that Absolutely. related to, to the importance of addressing the, the health of the kids that are going through the school and the importance related to their academic achievement related to, to their health. And Commissioner, that, that recommendation might fit, as I'm thinking right now, of our work in our plan for developmental education in addressing the preparedness of students uh, there is a section there that that might fit, really fit much better than putting it just, it doesn't mean you can't speak to it in this document, but there is a vehicle there in an objective where that might be able to be added much easier. Because it, it just surfaces under that advising, that uh, degree plan placement, when I say degree plan, the, the plan of action for helping students improve. And you want to make sure that when you bring students that are, that are in, going into developmental education, and whether it's one course, an accelerated course, that you have a healthy child that's moving forth. And so there may be a way to, we can add that in that one caveat as well. 
That's what I'm saying. We have a state plan that's moving forward. Well, I, might be some I, I, I would I would suggest uh, in regard to, to David's comments that that we do it in both places. I, since this is the general document, the overarching document, uh, statements about the correlation between uh, doing well academically, doing well educationally, and being healthy. Uh, is, is obviously a central point that we have to make, and I, I suggest that uh, why don't why don't uh, we uh, uh, wait for you? We we're kind that of on a strict timeline. Why well, don't we, we wait for you to to uh, recommend places where those kinds of uh, references can be made, and certainly in the overview, we can make a statement about the the relationship between uh, health, good health, and and good educational outcomes. And we have the other plan that we can add that is one of the objectives in that as they develop the plan of action for students that that also be addressed. That can, that can be a, that's a real, there's a place to really, really have that connection in there. Yeah. And that's, that's precisely the, the point of having the membership that we have on this council to make sure that uh, although clearly the focus is on educational outcomes, it's important to note the relationship uh, between good health and educational attainment. It's important to note uh, that we have a large number of, of, of children with special needs that have to be attended to and that we need to make sure that uh, we talk about all of these issues in this overarching document. So I agree. We'll, we'll make we'll make those changes. Um, if it's uh, if it's agreeable to the membership, uh, why don't we w uh, listen to uh, Drew's uh, presentation? Then we'll talk about taking a final vote on this document. So why don't we? we can, once don't you we have done that, and we've heard the presentation, you have your recommendations. We can send it out electronically, so you can scan through it and see where you would think it best fits. And we can make those changes, resend it out to you, and then uh, it doesn't go, like I said, till the end of the month to our board. Yeah, we can take the vote electronically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So why don't we proceed to item uh, agenda item eight, and. Uh, uh, get this presentation from Drew. Great. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I would, I would say that uh, presentation is probably a bit overstated. I, uh, when we were asked for our input, put together a couple of uh, uh, items that um, had seemed to be important. But this is this is the best PowerPoint you're going to have on this. So no, your uh, comments. Then. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so, you know, I think for. You know, governor deserves a lot of credit. Several years ago, he created the Governor's Competitiveness Council. I believe you were on that, and um, several uh, were on that. Um, and one of the key uh, findings that they had had was that states that are more coordinated and more integrated in their learning functions uh, were going to be more adaptable in a pretty rapidly changing economy. So. Um, I saw many of the uh, thoughts, suggestions, recommendations as in the in the vein of systems which can converge, systems which can simplify, um, and can become more effective because of that convergence and simplification. So, uh, I don't think any of the uh, recommendations I put down there are in front of you. So I'll just characterize them orally, but I'd put them into three categories. One was sort of a better understanding of demand-driven need. And I think to, to what, uh, um, what Mr. Temple was saying about uh, employer data, we, we have quite a bit of it. I think there's still some additional data we could pull out that could help give an even better sense to the higher ed and K-12 side. Uh, one thing that happens a lot in regional chambers is that we do business retention and expansion visits, where we'll talk to the CEO or the senior executive of a primary employer, and we will ask them about what are the impediments to, to, to adding jobs in Central Texas. So we'll take them through a series of, you know, probably about a 45-minute series of questions that can ask about what kind of hiring they have, what kind of specific hiring um, concerns that they're having, and what kind of skill levels that they're having uh, difficulty hiring. Then we can take that more granularly down to the HR level. But we do this with about 300 executives a year in certain key areas so that we can get information about how to remove barriers to job growth. 
So the first suggestion had been to, to create a statewide BRNE portfolio where we're modeling what we want to be growing in this state um, and that we would be having um, these kind of conversations. It can be driven through chambers or it can be driven through the Workforce Commission, but it can be building out that information set about primary employment um, in Texas and, uh, and where we may be seeing hiccups. It's, it's more anecdotal, but it can help fill out some of the, the LMI data that's coming out of the Workforce Commission, um, either on their monthly reports or in their 10-year projections. The second is in the Work in Texas platform, which is extremely well used, I think, as a platform, um, you know, as technology is iterated very quickly, it, it may need some look at updating the platform, which is a state cost. Um, but the Work in Texas platform has something that no one else does, which is a legal commitment to, to file your information on it if you're looking for state benefits. It, it's a tremendous platform that we can build state proficiencies where we can help um, the, uh, the job seeker to know what employers are looking for at a proficiency level. It's a way to send information to higher education about where we have uh, short-term shortages in, in proficiency needs and where there may be a demand for a program. So I think that platform is incredibly powerful as a communication tool between higher ed public ed and, uh, and K-12. And the third is um, we've had some pioneering work in this state on detailed work analyses. And these are profiling or mapping the, the types of proficiencies in a given industry or a given occupation. And we can feed that information back to higher ed. We can feed that information back to public ed. Uh, it, it's frustrating to me. It may be frustrating to others, this sort of kind of uh, false dilemma of is it college or career? It can't be both. Um, I think what's very clear to people in the private sector and especially in some of the skilled trades is, you know, there's a thought that if, you know, that the current system somehow is preventing students from going into welding, as if you didn't need to know geometry and you didn't need to know trig and you didn't need to be able to read at an 11th grade level a technical manual and you didn't need to write a, a, a technical memo to your, uh, to your organization. These are doing some kind of a deep, uh, detailed work analyses in key areas can help inform curriculum and also help it communicate across that academic technical divide. So that was sort of under understanding better demand-driven need. The second was on a better uh, and timelier set of needed data to help guide decision making. Um, the um, the education research centers, and I'm so pleased that Commissioner Williams is in the position he's in, is a tremendous opportunity. The ERC is a tremendous opportunity to get additional information in. I think it makes imminent sense that we should ask for um, the Workforce Commission to be a full partner in that effort, that it should have a predictable schedule. Um, but the ERCs are a really critical way for us to figure out how to improve um, post-secondary preparation, post-secondary readiness, enrollment success, and subsequent enrollment into the military or into the workplace u using UI wage records. We need to be integrating these systems, reducing the cycle time, and allowing researchers, uh, including PhD students, the ability to, to, to feed us information and to feed the people that are working in the trenches information about how to help reduce cycle time and improve outcomes. Uh, in that also, in that vein, is to accelerate the Texas State Data System, which the agency has been in partnership with. You know, in, in this Austin being a software town, a five-year rollout would be considered, you know, almost understanding that public sector is one thing. A five-year rollout is just a very long period of time. Um, that's about um, probably 21 business cycles in the software industry. So how do we accelerate this platform uh, with the data system and how do we integrate that data system in with Work in Texas and make sure that these can talk to each other and iterate um, at a faster level? The third is better transferability. This is a highly mobile state, a highly mobile population. Um, dual credit, which was a legislative decision back in the early 2000s, um, had been a way for the system to uh, validate having community college provide academic courses in the high school and to make sure that students had the ability to buy down the cost of higher education, improve the rigor of the classes they were taking. 
Um, I think it's important for us to say that this is a critical integration tool and dual credit is an appropriate way to integrate. Um, it is an inefficiency. We do overpay, but I think it's one that's it's an, it's a valued and necessary one that helps uh, accelerate folks to be ready for jobs that exist today. As a related one is the advanced technical credit. And the advanced technical credit, in my opinion, is one of those great P16 or P higher ed or P workforce uh, efforts where you're trying to define the knowledge somebody needs and holding as variable where they receive that knowledge and where they learn that knowledge. And the advanced technical credit means you can take it to any high school in the state or any community college in the state and not end up getting tripped up by this uh, almost kind of feudal system of articulation agreements uh, between community colleges and individual high schools or individual districts. So I think putting additional uh, um, um, motivation and, and uh, influence behind the advanced technical credit as a way to allow students that are going to be mobile to take credits earned in Houston and take them to Austin and take them to um, uh, Wichita Falls is going to help uh, reduce costs to Texans and it will increase uh, successful outcomes. F finally, I would say that, um, you know, be the the uh, funding for the Texas grant is something that I think is so critical to this state. Um, the Metro Chambers of Commerce have again said that this is our big priority to make sure that it is 100 percent funded. This probably exceeds the jurisdiction of this group, but I think it's a tremendous way for higher education to signal to students what they need to do to be ready for higher education. And the changes that were made last year were so important in telling students not only that they need to take a well-rounded course of study, but they also needed to be ready to do college-level work to increase the likelihood of success. And so the best way that we can encourage students to do what we're asking them to do is to make sure that if they do what we ask them to do, there's a Texas grant at the end of that. And so those were a set of recommendations that I was putting forth um, and uh, um, we're, we're wanting to put forward to your consideration on better integration of, of, uh, of all of our efforts. Any, uh, any questions or comments? Well, I, that, I was going to say that took all of mine because I think Drew covered all the points I was going to bring up under number eight or, or most of them, but I think very, very, you know, I think the continued funding and maybe consideration of making permanent the, the funding of dual enrollment. I think I think the studies have shown the, the impact that that has and I think that the Texas grant, uh, you know, I think f f if, if, if we're serious about really wanting to, to reach the goals, uh, I, think, I think having the Texas grant available to the young people that, that meet uh, that criteria is very, very important. And I do think also that more, um, getting even more intentional about um, linking together uh, uh, the, uh, both the workforce needs and areas we want to grow and prospective future areas with, uh, with, the, with the interrelated uh, college and high school work is, is, is uh, you know, is really a, uh, an area to focus on. So I think that I think that you covered those areas very well. Any? Uh, th those are really good suggestions. Any more? Yes. Uh, Mary? Judy's going to pull her hair out after this. And the, <laughs> Judy, would you come back the, up here, the, please? Uh, the Literacy Council, which uh, TEA, Higher Ed, Workforce Commission, um, are the three agencies that are represented. Uh, this was created the legislature the last session. Plus, we have uh, the provider community uh, of adult ed uh, represented and the business community. And we just adopted our um, recommendations to the legislature due November the 1st related to enhancing, improving, expanding, you name it, uh, the, uh, the adult ed uh, system in Texas. And I'm just wondering if possibly that may be something, because a lot of it goes to what you're talking about, a lot of it goes to what all of us have talked about on dropout prevention, family literacy, all the things that we're talking about, and wondering if maybe that's something that the council would want to consider 
including in our recommendation. Because there are recommendations in there that are there's no there are no recommendations telling the legislature to give a bunch of money to anybody. We knew we, we, we knew we had to be realistic, but there are things about supporting integration and using technology and, and expanding best practices that have been identified in the state and things like that. So with that, I would you know recommend that maybe we include that or endorse that. I mean, it's you and I and Michael have signed off on it. Yes. Uh, but as part of the P-16, we may want to include it in something that, something that we do. I don't know, maybe another report that we would do, and maybe this is the umbrella. But I just throw that out when we're talking about those are those are legislative recommendations that you or I or Michael maybe ask about if we're a, you know, whatever committee we're before. We'll who probably knows? Probably all be asked. Yeah, you can't ever yeah. tell. <laughs> I think it probably would be appropriate with this report because it is a report of the work mm -hmm. and it, it certainly taps into any of those areas. And so I don't, this is my opinion because the commissioner and the key officers will make the final decision, but I, I certainly think that it would fit in. Well, let, let, let me uh, let me propose this. This is this is gone from uh, <laughs> tweaking the document to, to significantly <laughs> revising the document. So uh, I suggest we suspend taking a vote on the document today. Uh, we will respond to every one of your um, mm -hmm. suggestions. Uh, if you want to make sure that we get the language precisely. Uh, then uh, I urge you to, to send us your comments and your proposed revisions as quickly as possible. And what I'll we do will... is send it out electronically, and we've already, Priscilla's already been working, finding some places in the document where your thoughts it could easily go into. We will highlight that and then let you look at it and then share your thoughts with us of what you would like in there. Then once we've edited the document, we will send it back out in red so you'll know exactly what has been said. Mr. Shiverly has already given us. We have his his items. Okay. He, he did turn them in. And so, Dr. King, if you would share with yours also electronically with us. And right. and I think I've, I've seen your stuff through uh, the, the recommendations you all have with Linda Munoz. And we can definitely, yes, yeah, she's got them. So we can definitely take them. And then we'll send the document back out. Of course, the commissioner will have it. And what we can do at our board meeting, because this was originally on a consent item, I can ask the chair of the, of the committee to pull it from consent, and then I will represent the document. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, these were, these were very good suggestions, very and good. we'll follow up appropriately. Uh, we, we probably, uh, I suggest that uh, while some of these ideas are fresh in our minds. We, we meet to talk about revising this document when, when this meeting is over. Not a problem. And um, you will be getting the document by the time you're back at your office. How's that for service? Yeah. We've actually come to the end of our agenda, which yeah. is uh, a record. record time. <laughs> um, so I will, uh, knowing that we have to follow up on on this particular issue very quickly, uh, and we will, I will uh, entertain a motion for adjournment. I move. I move. Second. All in favor? Thank you very Thank much. You.